so I, I worked on this on Thursday during the snowstorm, by the way. So I was sitting looking out my window. Earlier in the week, we, we had uh, the wood ducks have come back to our pond. We've got geese on the pond, a hooded merganser, which is really cool. Um, so it's really been fun. And the crocuses were actually poking out on Monday. Even here at Unity, you have some, we have some planted right out front here, right? And so it's like, oh, cool, it's actually going to happen. Well, then it snowed. Um, <laughs> but we're still in the turning, turning here in Minnesota, even, aren't we? And we're moving away from that balance of the equinox, moving into the light. He was talking about moving that darkness into the light. And like many of the insights that we hope for, uh, spiritual insights, if you will, um, they take some work. Right? They don't just come to us. And so to me, this week was just another example of that. On one hand, it's easy because spring is coming and then we get smacked across the face again with winter. And so we have to work a little harder. Those crocus aren't just jumping out of the ground calling out my name. I have to just remember them in there. So it takes a little work in the, in the, in the midst of this. And I think that's, I think that's kind of accurate for um, some of the insights that we try to gain anyway sometimes. We do, they do take some work on our part, some discipline, if you will. And uh, I don't know, does anyone else plant seeds indoors? We're taking a year off. I'm going to keep my seeds indoors. This is not something. Do you have them in yet? They're inside. Yeah. have brought them outside. Yeah, they'll go. Oh, of course, right. Um, so we took a year off, and I missed that. It's such a fun thing to sort of have those tiny little seeds that are going to nurture you. And I think there's something to consider at this time of year about the fragility of that which we hope will come into fruition later this summer. Whether it's lambing, our neighbors have sheep and goats, and I'm sure there's these tiny little things trying to survive in this winter. Um, if I grew up, we grew up with cattle, and even in Ohio, um, calving was always a risky temperature at this time of year because if you could get smacked with winter with these tiny little um, creatures that are so vulnerable that are trying to make it. Um, the seeds that we plant similarly, it's, I'm amazed, I'm just amazed. I've never done this. I have a friend who always scatters his spinach seeds on the snow because then the, the water will help them get into the, they only need a very um, low or very high, I guess, planting, and they'll, they'll come up. And he always does that, I think it's a great sign of hope. And then the buds, I, you, some of you have heard me talk about our apple trees, but you know, apple trees are so vulnerable this time of year, and they're so fragile to go out there and see the buds popping out. The pussy willows are out, one spot of pussy willows in my place, which is just such a vulnerable thing that can just get smacked again. Um, and I think that that, to me, is really speaking of where we are in our, in our lives of faith, that the things which most nurture us, that we also have to nurture when they're really, really vulnerable, when they're really, really vulnerable. Those are your parents and what this is about, I'm sure as well. So I want to read a poem. I found this. It's so much fun lately doing this stuff. A buddy of mine, Steve Klepitar, who now lives out in Massachusetts as a published poet, and he and I were colleagues at St. Cloud State for years. And one year in the spring, I came into work just exulting about the blackbirds being back. That's always the thing for us when the red-winged blackbirds come back. And um, so I'm gonna, I want to read this poem for you. And some of it's out there. The poets are always out there, but I'll repeat a few of the lines. But it's called Here in the Hall of Words, and it's a poem you wrote for me, so I was really touched by this. I whisper and the world goes quiet. All those electric hums change to an unheard frequency, scrabbling rats just below the threshold of sound. Today wind is still and this cold air penetrates silently. Red wings have returned to the homestead, claiming their space, darting like silent rockets around the leafless trees. I shiver and songs hammer against walls. My voice whines along the river. Like a cloud, I darken and rain, language through the valley. I become a wave breaking against gray rocks, an echoing lighthouse on a headland near the sea. Unstop your ancient ears. Taste new wine surging up from earth, complex and delicate flavors bursting on spindly tongues of new light. Sorry about the scrabbling rats part. And it throws me off a little bit, but I'll repeat the end. Unstop your ancient ears. Again, this connection with the history that we are. Taste new wine surging up from earth. Complex, delicate flavors bursting on spindly tongues of new light. Hope that my next time in the snow will be on, we can repeat that in which one more time. So, Palm Sunday. Thanks again, Dean, for that reminder. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting about, even though we had to cancel this last week, was this class that a handful of you are participating in on the uh, five principles. It's been a reminder, really, uh, both through the immersion um, that some of us have, or some of the traditional images we have for divinity, if you will, the theistic images, if you will, that um, people in unity have really kind of stepped away from. And again, theistic is this idea of God as a supernatural being that's out there somewhere, right? That's theism. That's a spawn. Um, 
John Shelby Spong, Episcopal priest, uh, bishop actually, as a term he introduced that to me, the idea that God is out here somewhere. Um, and yet even in the more um, in the text that we're using for that class, uh, and some of you remember this, there's an entire, she does a preface where she goes through a whole list of the terms for God, right? Because there's so many different ones. I mean, some of you have heard me talk about lately, I've been really reminded of Paul Tillich's notion of the ground of our being, which just is a very poetic. It doesn't work in our music very well, right? So we end up saying God, we end up saying Savior, we end up using the Christ. But I think it's really fun to wrestle with some of these images. Um, so she asked for patience, our author does in this book, for those of us in the class. Um, as we wrestle aloud in times with terms that might be loaded in the troughs, if you will, of our brain and our histories, um, with these notions of an external or a, a supernatural deity that's out here. And we do wrestle with that in our music, in our speech, in our prayers. But now, I think about on Palm Sunday, uh, when I think about the stories that we have from Palm Sunday, I'm reminded of um, Marcus Borg's insight about the idea that the Bible is both history and the so we look at those stories which still motivate us today. It is both history, it tells a story of something that happened, but then the ancients undergirded that with, with images, with images that might speak to us in addition to that history. And they cross at times, and I want to read a quote from him about that, which I find kind of intriguing. Okay. So what he says is, he's, uh, the recognition that the Bible contains both history and metaphor has immediate implication. The ancient communities that produced the Bible often metamorphized their history. So they added stories to their history, images to the history, right? They embellish, if you will. Indeed, this is the way they invested their stories with meaning. But we, especially in the modern period, have oftentimes historicized their metaphors. We've taken these wonderful images and stories, and we act as if that's the history. It's an interesting piece. I hope, I mean, to me that jumps a little bit at some of what I think we wrestle with um, as we do our flow through the years sometimes. But this idea that allow the metaphor to be the metaphor within the history as opposed to assuming that the metaphor becomes the history. Now, when I was a kid in Sunday school, that made sense. Those Sunday school stories were really rich that I heard as a kid, and believe me, I had no sense of the difference. They were, they were fantastical, and they told me stories, and I was a child, and those made sense to me. But I think as we move forward as adults, it's really important to separate those two and find where there's a meaning. So with the Palm Sunday story we just told this year, it's interesting for me to ask what's history and what undergirds that story that we might learn from today. And we heard that a little bit in just the reading of the Daily Word. I think you probably captured some of that. And again, Borg says, a metaphorical approach to the Bible thus emphasizes metaphors and their associations. It emphasizes seeing, not believing. Emphasizes C, what might we see in these stories. So what's the history on this Palm Sunday? That's, uh, this is Mike's brief history. <laughs> so Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus, arrived in Jerusalem, and by the end of the week he would be killed. After a tug of war between the uh, church of the day, the state and the church, if you will, and who would have to, who would get stuck doing the killing? Who's going to get stuck with this on their record? Right? That's part of the story that we know. Now the metaphor that jumps out of that, three of them that I'll come back to later, that I think is interesting is the idea that he came in on a donkey. A very, very humble approach, right? And yet was welcomed by the people as a king and a savior. Right? That's an interesting juxtaposition, isn't it? And that he came in with a self-understanding that his time was up. Right? That's part of the story. That's part of the metaphor that we know about this story is he did show up, but the metaphor that we hear is that he came with foreknowledge. Well, he knew what he was walking into. All right? And he did that in his eyes wide open. And the other piece of the metaphor that I want to explore today is this idea that march from death to life as part of the cycle. And the life part is something that's celebrated across the world next week on Easter Sunday in different ways. So let's talk, let's talk, I want to take back now and talk a little bit about language, which is really the core. I just spent last week talking a lot about images of the divine. Today I really want to hone in on Jesus and this concept of the historical Jesus to start. So this historical Jesus refers to a human being, a historical human being, who has motivated people, whether they're Christians or not, around the world. Because this person who clearly lived a life which resonated with the people of his time. And even
to the lack of clear historical data, we know that this was someone who cared for those who suffered, who reached out to those who were outside of the norm in society, was a strong person of faith, was a strong believer in Judaism, followed the precepts of Judaism, didn't try to start a new religion, <laughs> right? He was very, very strong in his faith. And who really seems to have challenged in some of his language some of the theism I talked about earlier, this idea of a distant supernatural God, that in some of the stories we know of him, that he challenged that. Okay? That he challenged that. that his, his conversations about what in that language was the kingdom of God is here, is present among us, is in you, is we embrace the unity, right? Those are, those are, that actually, those stories, that's before you even get to the metaphor, that that's part of how he lived. And, and I was reminded this week in my own research, um, again by Bishop Spong, that the first written records we really have of Jesus and Nazareth is not the order that they are in the Bible. It's actually Paul. There's much more reason. And some, his, stuff, his, his stuff, Paul's got some problems, trust me, and the women in the room read that, know that, this guy's no saint. But it doesn't have some of the, um, what I would call some of the more fantastical stories about Jesus. There's nothing in there about the virgin birth, or the archetypal even stories, as I like to call them. There's nothing in there about a virgin birth. The resurrection of the body is not part of Paul's stuff, right? So it's interesting that his first story is about um, Jesus' the history piece, if you would, um, doesn't include some of that. Now, the Christ is a different thing. Okay? It was not Jesus' last name. All right? I think that's, I just, <laughs> just want to get that out there. Um, and so when you, when you hear it in the people use the terms, um, just it's important to distinguish the difference between that. And within unity, of course, we talk about a very, very different. And for many, of course, that's still, even the Christ, and we know this in many traditions, probably the tradition I was raised in, is still a separate supernatural being, right? Out here, sitting side by side with the Father, that's, you know, that's, that's the image that's out there. But within this movement, of course, we talk about the Christ as that spark of divinity that we have inside of each other, and that we see in others, right? Not just people, and, and the planet, and, and the animals, and the seeds, but that spark. And the Christ, the Christ, is, if you would be, a conduit for the notion of the realm, the realm, the ground of being, the realm of God, um, is right here and right now. That we celebrate right now. That's our affirmative prayer, right? That's, that's where we get that. So I think it's important in our work um, to understand this about our history, but it's also really fun to struggle, struggle with, wrestle with, enjoy finding out language as we speak to others about unity, that brings in the breadth of the images of God, even if it comes from this history. I was just talking to Sarah and her colleague about that this week. You know, how do we speak, how do we take the message of this place as we have an opportunity to speak to others in a way that makes sense? Here we can kick around. You can, you're, you're willing to let me mess around with language here, right? <laughs> but it's a little bit more of a challenge. We say, well, this is who we are. And we've got some great statements for that, which is really fun. It's really fun to do that. So before we get back to Palm Sunday, I really am going to get back to the things I was talking about. I'm going to end with a little bit more language, and this is from John um, Shelby Spong. You may know this guy if you don't. Let me read. He wrote Why Christianity Must Change or Die. Really, um, there were really two issues that, my understanding, I've read a number of his books, um, that really drove him to challenge his own faith community, which is the Episcopal Church, but others as well. And one was the treatment of women, big surprise, and the other was of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Those were the two issues that he just felt could not resonate with Christian, traditional Christianity and really helped him leap into some other areas, which I think we, we all benefit from. And I don't really go with him. This is his book on a new Christianity for a new world. I don't, I don't buy all this stuff, but that's kind of neat. But I like this notes he says, a couple of images he has here. He says, I will remain rooted in my rooted, rooted I will say it, in my conviction that the word God, the source of our being, which are in the gender. This stands for and points to something that is real. It is very real. And in some way, he says, I will continue to assert that the Christ figure, again, the Christ, not the historical figure, was and is a manifestation of that reality that I call God. And that the life of Jesus opened for us all a way to enter that reality. So he's recognizing that his life, both historical life, and also the sense of the Christ, is still for him a window. I feel that way for myself. As far as I've walked away from the way I was raised, those stories are solid. And there's some rich richness there. 
And he says, that is, he says, I will seek to maintain that Jesus was a defining moment in the human journey of the meaning of God. And I will stake out a vision of how I believe his power can transcend the ages. So in what ways might this story be a gateway for us into this reality of the I'm, I'm going to offer you three suggestions this morning that resonate for me. Ways in which the story, the metaphors, if you will, help us see that this historical figure and also that which he was and became um, helps us understand our own sense of divinity. So the first one I mentioned earlier was that he came willingly to this place. That he walked with open eyes into what he knew would be his death. And a very violent death. That the idea of his ministry, his journey, his prayer, right, his prayer, would lead to an acceptance of his own death as part of the larger story. Recognition of death as part of the cycle of life. And he consistently challenged the notion, this is really important, that anything could ever separate us from the divine spark, including death. Now in unity we call that a transition, right? But that has its roots in this notion. And that's the story, that's part of his story. That's part of the story, the metaphor that undergirds the history. The idea that nothing, nothing separates us from that divine grace. The donkey, I love this part of the story, came on the donkey. That humility in the face of those who wanted a king to directly challenge the powers of be. This was one of the constant wrestles with the historical Jesus, by the way, right? But the stories are that consistently people said, we want a new king. Rome sucks, right? This is horrible. We need to overthrow these people. They're not treating us right. The church leadership is bad for business. They're corrupt. We need a new leader, right? And he faced that with great humility. With great humility. And that brings me to the last piece. The uh, palms and the cheers, right? That just adds to that. That was, again, the greeting of a king. Right? And what, what was his life? What are the stories that we know? That he said no to that. That power over was not the message. The message was power with. Okay? The message was power with. Some of you know I worked in the sexual assault field, and this is one of the, one of the most telling images that helped me in my work, particularly as we worked um, with abuse that's happened in the church. I'm not sure in the unity so much, but you all know the stories. Um, and a, a chunk of that really was the notion in those institutions, it happens in other places in our society too, of course, but the idea that when you are working with people that you have power over them, and that somehow that actually helps them. And we know that that's a bunch of around. That the way we help people, the way that we give, is we have power with, we empower other people, right? And that's, that's again, that's part of the metaphor, that's part of the story. Undergirds of this week. That's part of the story. So those couple of things, if you will. That willingness, that recognition of the cycle of life, death, life, humility in the face of people trying to push you up, and you say, well, thank you. And then this recognition, this really clear recognition that power is best when it's shared. That's the best way we can use our power. So when I think back to the cycles that we live in, here in this lovely place where we, where we live, my new parsonage up on the hill, as well as uh, every else place we call home. We look, we look for comfort and support and understanding and nurture in our lives, don't we? As we gather with other people. Um, and then we also look to nurture the seeds, the young, the vulnerable around us. But that's part of the gift, that's part of our life, that we have this give and take with one another. There's times you all have been here long enough, you all know this. There's times when we walk in this door and we are already juice when you come in here, when we walk in here, right? Life has been going great. Dean saw an eagle along the river this morning, right? That juice picks you up. And there are times when we walk in here and we're in pain. So there are times when we need to be nurtured. There's times when we are the people who are doing the nurturing. And my hope is that we simply be gentle with ourselves and that we're gentle with one another. That we're gentle with the plant. And perhaps, perhaps, we can glimpse some of the stories that undergird our experience of the physical realm. Because that's where the richness comes in. So when I hold that seed, that vulnerable, that tiny seed, the physical realm is just a seed. It doesn't weigh much, there's nothing there. But the story that undergirds it is what's going to nurture me, and hopefully my neighbors, maybe my neighbors, um, this summer, when those things bloom. And they multiply. That nurturing and that
that seed is where that comes from. But without the story, it's just a seed. So the material and the metaphor. But it's not just the history where this plays out, it's in our stories too. We have a history together, already, and we also have stories that have this history. And those stories is where the richness comes and where the meaning comes. And so my hope is that these stories, our stories, might also, as other good stories do, help us enter into the reality of the love, the juice, the unifying force, the ground of our being. And so it is. Thank you.